Hello, and welcome to this Chemistry World webinar on optimizing battery performance through materials characterization. I'm Philip Broadwith, Chemistry World's business editor. For those of you not familiar with GoToWebinar, if you haven't been to one of these before, um, just a few housekeeping things. GoToWebinar is an interactive platform. That's the main uh, reason why we use it. We want you to be able to ask questions to the experts uh, and the people that we've got in to talk about these topics. Um, that's the that's the the way we think the, you, that you get the best value out of these things. So do ask questions at any point. There's a box somewhere near the bottom of your GoToWebinar panel. By default, that's on the right hand side of your screen. You can type in any kind of question you have, um, and the questions are a really important part uh, of the webinar. So please don't wait till the end. You can ask questions at any point. If you miss any part of the presentation or you just want to watch it again on your own time to pick out some more details or look at the links and resources that we're sharing, then we'll be sending everyone who's attended or registered a link into the recording in a couple of days' time. Uh, and also to say thank you to you for attending live. You'll get a certificate of attendance in the same email. Um, so today's email is about using NMR and electron microscopy to understand the material properties of lithium and sodium ion batteries. Now, obviously, battery technology is a hugely important part of modern electronic devices, as well as uh, a huge contribution to the transition to renewable energy and how we, how we uh, supply energy in the future. But understanding how to get the best performance out of any kind of battery technology is really crucial to, uh, to, to developing those new technologies. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today, some of the key challenges in battery development and how some simple techniques using NMR electron microscopy can give some insight into the electrolyte development, cathode development, improve the safety of battery technology and reduce the costs. We've worked with Oxford Instruments to bring you this webinar. Um, and we think that you know the people that we've got here are real experts in the field and that they're going to bring you some information that you're really interested in. To make sure everything runs smoothly and on time, we've actually pre-recorded today's presentations. However, both of our speakers are here live in the webinar. They're going to be here for the whole session. They are going to be answering some of your questions in written form during the webinar. So if you want to ask questions, as I said earlier, at any point, just go and type them into the questions box near the bottom of the GoToWebinar panel. And you can see James and Alexandra are here uh, and they'll be eager to answer all your questions. So later on, we'll be hearing from Alexandra Stavropoulou, who is the segment marketing scientist at Oxford Instruments. She has a background in microanalytical techniques, mineralogy and geology. Uh, but first up, we've got James Sagar, who is a strategic product manager at Oxford Instruments. James is a physicist by training, and he now leads the company's benchtop NMR applications team. So I'll just ask Chris to uh, launch the video. It'll take a couple of seconds to, to get going. Um, but And while we're waiting for that, just a reminder, ask questions at any point. I'll be back later on in the webinar with some polls. So uh, let's hand over to the video now. Welcome to today's webinar, optimizing battery performance through materials characterization. With myself, Dr. James Sagar, and my colleague, Alexandra Stavropoulou. Today, we're going to discuss how materials characterization techniques, such as benchtop NMR and electron microscopy based analysis, can be used to significantly improve and optimize the performance of lithium and other ion batteries through detailed characterization of the materials within them. We're going to start by giving a brief introduction to lithium ion battery technology, the materials within, and areas where materials characterization can bring huge benefits to the performance of final battery materials. And we're going to discuss in significantly more detail how these techniques can be applied to battery material research and development, and then how those techniques can be applied and developed to ensure materials consistency through the production process so that you're, you can be confident in the performance of your final cells. We'll then have 
time for some questions. So to start with, a brief bit of a brief introduction. Now, this is a schematic of a typical lithium-ion battery, which I'm sure that most people listening to this webinar have seen before. On the left-hand side, we have our negative anode. On the right-hand side, we have our positive cathode. And in between those two, we have our electrolyte and our separator material. In current battery or lithium-ion battery, technology, the anode is typically a lithiated graphite. The cathode is a transition metal oxide. And the electrolyte is usually a liquid electrolyte saturating that separator material. And that electrolyte is a combination of organic solvents and inorganic lithium salts. By optimizing the characteristics of these materials and by developing new materials we can significantly improve the performance of batteries and as we're trying to improve that performance we tend to have to balance five key parameters that would be the energy density so essentially how much charge can we store in the battery the power density how quickly can we use that charge now obviously the safety it's no good having a high density storage and that you can discharge quickly if every time you do it, it catches fire. And we need to be able to do that repeatedly over a number of life cycles to minimize that range anxiety that electric vehicle drivers now feel. And obviously we need to minimize the cost so that we can fit this technology into everybody's daily lives. You can see here just how some current and future battery chemistries denoted by their cathode material fit when balancing those five parameters. With future NMC materials optimizing energy density and cost versus the current state of the art. And we're also seeing new materials that aren't on there, such as Johnson Matthews' new ELNO, ELNO uh, cathode and battery chemistry. If we look at what sort of materials we find in those batteries, well, I've already mentioned that current technologies are based on a lithiated graphite anode with a transition metal oxide cathode, typically a polymer separator, and then an electrolyte based on carbonated solvents, carbonated organic solvents, and usually a lithium hexafluorophosphate salt. But as we start to develop these materials and understand them better, we're starting to look at different anode materials, whether that's silicon carbon, lithium metal, or some of the newer chemistries in, for fast charging, such as lithium niobate, new cathode materials. Obviously, lithium ion phosphate is becoming uh, very popular with uh, many of the big battery suppliers now supplying lithium ion phosphate based batteries and Tesla moving to use them in um, a much higher percentage of their cars for the future. And also things like lithium air batteries. People are looking at a wider range of separator materials and also those electrolytes, especially as we look to move away from liquid state batteries to potentially all solid state batteries, then there's a lot of work to be done on the development of new electrolytes, as well as extending the performance of our current electrolytes. What sort of challenges can we meet with these characterization techniques? Well, we can look at ion concentration for energy density. We can look at ionic conductivity and transference for understanding power density. We can make a lot of measurements around safety whether that's electrolyte quality, additive concentrations, and the development of new additives to build better SEI layers, whether that's separator quality, or the raw materials that go into your electrodes, ensuring the quality and consistency of those materials. There's a huge way that materials characterization can benefit final battery um, in terms of safety. 
In lifespan, we can look at mechanisms of electrolyte breakdown or dendrite formation. And obviously, cost, although this doesn't necessarily drive down the cost per cell, by being able to perform this analysis right next to where you're performing your development, you can significantly reduce your overall development costs to deliver new formulations to market. So let's talk more about the actual characterization techniques and what that actually gives you. First, I'm going to start by discussing how benchtop NMR can be used for electrolyte development. But let's start by getting everybody on the same page as to what benchtop NMR spectroscopy is. Well, NMR spectroscopy starts with the idea that several nuclei have a non-zero nuclear spin. That's where our nuclear comes from. In a bulk sample, we have many of those nuclei all randomly orientated. When we apply a, apply a large external magnetic field, we can align a proportion of those nuclear spins. And once we have a proportion of those aligned with the field, we can start to do interesting things by exciting them with a radio frequency pulse that rotates our magnetic moment, inducing a resonance, and that's where we get our nuclear magnetic resonance from. Once that pulse is removed, that rotation decays and induces a electric current in our pickup electronics, giving us a free induction decay. We can keep going through that excitation and relax, relaxation cycle to build up signal and average out noise. At some point, we can then Fourier transform that to give us the typically uh, seen NMR spectrum. But we can get data from both the free induction decay and the spectrum. When most people think of NMR, they think of these large cryogenically cooled systems that require a building of their own. What I'm talking about today is benchtop NMR, which, as the name would suggest, fits on the bench in your lab. And you can see a schematic on the right here. We have a separate box for our magnetic field and our, our electronics. We can place a sample directly in there as we're performing our development or building new chemistries and start to perform experiments on them to understand their properties. The wonderful thing about XPulse, our benchtop NMR system, is that it has a broadband X channel. That means that you can pr probe a wide range of NMR active nuclei. Typically, NMR is often performed on proton, hydrogen, fluorine, carbon and phosphorus for those organic molecules. But there are a wide range of NMR active nuclei that are much more interested to batteries. Within the frequency range of our X channel, we have things like lithium, sodium, boron, and potentially silicon, as well as a wide range of other nuclei denoted here in both the bright orange and the teal color. What does that actually look like when we start looking at a commercial battery material? Well, here is a typical proton spectrum from a commercial battery electrolyte. We can see a strong solvent, organic solvent peak, at about 3.7 ppm. And we see a lot of smaller signals that come from the additives to that electrolyte. Those additives are there to form both uh, a good SEI, stabilize the electrolyte, and also prevent degradation. They could actually also be degradation byproducts. As the X pulse is a high performance spectrometer, we can perform some advanced experiments. We can actually suppress that major solvent peak to emphasize some of those smaller impurity or additive peaks. Now, proton is pretty typically used in NMR, and so is carbon. And again, we can probe the solvent using um, carbon 13 NMR. And we can see all the peaks that we would expect to be associated with the organic salt. Once we get to fluorine NMR, we start to see more interesting things when we're probing the battery material themselves. Here we can see from this fluorine spectrum, we have a doublet arising from the hexafluorophosphate of our lithium salt, as well 
as a much more complex multiplet arising from one of the additives uh, from the solvent itself. The beauty of NMR is that it's inherently quantitative. If we integrate the area of the, that PF6 doublet, then we find out exactly how much anion we have in our solution. And we can obviously apply that to a seven lithium spectrum. We can integrate that peak to find out exactly how much of our cation we have in solution. We can, on the same instrument, measure boron. This particular electrolyte has a boron compound in it that's often used to prevent parasitic reactions. We can look at the chemical shift of the boron spectrum to understand at which point in its reaction cycle it is, so we know how stable our formulation is. And finally, we can create a beautiful splitting pattern with our 31 phosphorus by once again measuring that hexafluorophosphate salt, where we see this very nice septet arising from the coupling of six equivalent fluorine atoms to that single phosphorus. And that shows you just a bit of the information we can extract from simple one-dimensional NMR spectra. However, when you're looking at development, one of the things that's really interesting is what we call diffusion NMR. Now, by performing a specific pulse sequence, so a chain of RF pulses, we can generate a dephasing of the NMR active nuclei dependent on their diffusion coefficient. What that means is we increase the strength of a what we call a gradient pulse in our NMR spectrometer. We see a decrease in signal. We can fit that decrease in signal using the statistical Tanner equation. And from that, we have a very nice straight line fit, assuming our gradients are linear, which they are. And that allows us, from the negative of that gradient, to calculate our NMR diffusion coefficient. Once we have that diffusion coefficient, we can start to do interesting things, such as calculate the ionic conductivity or the cation transference number. In practice, what does that look like? Well, here we have proton, fluorine, and lithium spectrum from a typical commercial uh, formulation. And we can see that there are two solvents there, ethylene carbonate and dimethyl carbonate. They have two slightly different diffusion coefficients. We can see the slightly different diffusion behavior in the plot there. In the center, we have our fluorine NMR showing the diffusion of our hexafluorophosphate anion. We can calculate that diffusion coefficient. And again, we can calculate the diffusion coefficient of our lithium. From those two, we can measure or calculate the ionic conductivity and the cation transference. Here, the transference being point, uh, effectively 0.4, which isn't necessarily that great for a lithium ion battery where you want the, uh, almost all of the charge to be carried on your lithium ions. Here, only 40% would be. We can extend that so it's not just a for one system. Here we see we use a lithium hexafluorophosphate salt in three different solvents and also a slightly more advanced uh, sample of lithium TFSI in tetragon G4, a typical formulation that you might use with uh, a lithium metal electrode. And you can see that we get very different diffusion behavior. We see a decrease in the gradient as we go from as we change the solvent from dimethyl carbonate to a mixture of dimethyl carbonate and ethylene carbonate, and then finally into propylene carbonate for that lithium PF6. The TFSI in tetragline has a lower diffusion coefficient still. But from all those, we can calculate everything we need. The beauty of the x is that it's the only benchtop NMR instrument that allows you to characterize your electrolytes at a range of temperatures. Here, we're able to measure our lithium diffusion from 2.7 degrees to 55 degrees over an almost 60 or potentially even 70 degree uh, temperature range. We can start to understand exactly how our electrolyte would perform over the typical operating temperature window 
of a lithium-ion battery. And you can see on the right just how that temperature change affects the diffusion behaviour, with diffusion being directly proportional to that gradient there. And as this is about development, well, a formulation that is getting a lot of interest in the press recently are sodium-ion batteries. 23 sodium is also NMR active, which means you can do anything that I've already shown you with a sodium ion battery chemistry. Here, an example is shown of diffusion of um, sodium hexafluorophosphate. And you can see that once again, we can measure the diffusion of that sodium nucleus. I'll now hand over to Alexandra, who's going to talk to you through using scanning electron microscopy techniques for materials characterization. Today, we will talk about types of solid-state battery material characterization to improve battery performance. To begin with, let me start with a short introduction on how scanning electron microscopes work. Sample analysis takes place in the chamber of a scanning electron microscope, typically under vacuum conditions and inert atmosphere, by irradiating solid samples with an electron beam. Scanning electron microscopes Use an electron beam to illuminate the sample and focus on it. The electron beam is focused on the sample surface with a set of electromagnets. So what happens when an electron beam impinges on the sample surface? When high energy electrons penetrate into the surface of a material, they create the tear drop, which you can see on the left. The beam impingement on the sample surface gives rise to a series of phenomena occurring at the same time as a result of the beam sample interaction. The image shows schematically the depth from which these phenomena arise. For the purposes of today's presentation, we will be focusing on the backscattered electrons and the characteristic X-rays. The higher the beam energy, the larger and deeper the interaction volume and vice versa. Backscattered electrons give information about atomic number contrast, so the higher the atomic number, the brighter the black and white image, whereas the characteristic X-rays provide chemical information about the sample. On the right, the Monte Carlo simulation shows what the teardrop looks like in a more realistic manner. The characteristic X-ray signal is produced as long as the microscope beam is on. The generated signal is collected by an energy dispersive spectrometer or EDS detector. The EDS detector is placed between the microscope pole piece and the sample. The sample chemistry is determined by converting the signal into counts per second as the sensitive electronics distinguish the often subtle energy variations of the characteristic X-rays. The data collected is depicted as peaks in an X-ray energy spectrum. The peak positions are characteristic of elements, whereas the peak height designates the relative abundance of elements present in the sample. Maps of areas can also be scanned to reveal the different element distribution in a sample and thus create a sample overview. This can be done live without recording the data if the objective is to quickly scan a sample to locate areas of interest. EDS is popular with analysts because the EDS detectors collect the entire energy spectrum at once without having to predetermine elements to collect data from, permitting thus the analysis of completely unknown samples. Plus, the EDS datasets can be reprocessed offline. And now we will start with a beam sensitive solid state electrolyte sample. Battery materials are often beam sensitive. Solid state electrolytes is such a case. When a beam sensitive material is irradiated with a high dose of electrons, it eventually breaks down. When that happens, the sample is no longer being analyzed. What is analyzed instead is the damage caused by the beam on the sample surface. The two images at the bottom of the slide show how noticeable the beam damage is even at a relatively low accelerating voltage. Early work into this field showed the possibilities of improved EDS map resolution and accuracy 
by moving to lower incident electron energies. In this slide, we see the results of EDS analysis of a solid state garnet electrolyte sample. The sample on the left was analyzed for 10 minutes at 5 kV with a 500 picoampere beam current. The peaks of the elements found can be seen in the spectrum on the left and they are well defined and according to expectations. In the middle, you can see the area mapped and the element distribution. However, the sample suffered significant beam damage. Lithium exfoliated from the sample surface and formed dendrites. Due to the beam damage, the EDS map cannot be considered representative of the initial elemental distribution. So what can we do about it? In this slide, you will see results from a similar type of material and experiment but using different settings and a windowless detector. The rectangle in the first image denotes the analyzed area. This time the sample has been analyzed for 7 minutes and at a much lower beam energy and one-fifth of the previous beam current, so 100 picoamperes. The elements present were confirmed and well-defined based on 1 kV X-ray lines. In the middle, you can see the EDS map and on the right, what the area looks like after acquiring EDS data for 7 minutes. Beam damage is significantly lower compared to the previous example. So, beam-sensitive samples can be reliably analyzed while keeping beam damage at a reasonable minimum. In this section, we will talk about cathode and anode foil analysis. The foils studied here are used for pouch type batteries. For cathodes, the composition used is lithium nickel cobalt aluminium oxide, abbreviated as NCA. As nickel and cobalt concentrations affect capacitance, we were interested in mapping core cell concentration gradients of nickel and cobalt in the particles distributed throughout the foil. The anode samples studied were made of graphite foil with silicon nanoparticles. Silicon nanoparticles increase capacitance but expand and contract during cycling, which generates mechanical straining resulting in battery degradation. The images and elemental maps in this slide were acquired at 20 kV with a windowed EDS detector. Due to the high accelerating voltage, the interaction volume is large and therefore causes loss of particle definition. The result is blurry particle outlines besides the nickel signal that comes from everywhere. The higher level of definition in the oxygen map is due to the oxygen absorption. In comparison with lower accelerating voltage analysis at 5 kV, 1 nanoampere and windowless detector, the interaction volume becomes smaller and the surface resolution improves dramatically. Mapping of nickel is obviously better with grains well defined. Similarly, fluorine and cobalt are mapped with higher fidelity. The delamination visible at the lower part of the section is an effect of the sample preparation. High resolution DEM level analysis can be done on the cathode particles. The particles analyzed here are of a diameter of about 10 microns. With the line scan, the two spectra, the middle, the nickel cobalt distribution is revealed, showing a cobalt rich cell and nickel rich core. The same is observed in the individual maps on the right and the layered map at the bottom right. Moving to the graphite anodes now. As mentioned earlier, silicon nanoparticles on the one hand increase capacitance, on the other hand cause the battery to degrade quicker due to the expansion contraction they experience with cycling. The objective here was to map the nanoparticle distribution within the anode, the results of which you can see here. On the left, a layered map of the anode section, whereas on the right, two elements map, silicon in uh, light blue and oxygen in light green. Apart from silicon and oxygen, trace elements were detected across the anode sample. These were primarily tin and zircon. The tin and zircon elemental distribution maps 
can be seen on the right. All maps come from the same analyzed area. The table at the bottom shows the other elements that were found as well as their quantification. In this section, we will focus on the structural information we can measure in solid crystalline samples with EBSD. Electron backscatter diffraction is an SEM-based technique which can be used to acquire crystallographic data from crystalline materials. It's a surface analysis technique making use of the backscatter electron signal. The sample surface must be polished so that scratches and other imperfections do not affect the signal generation. EBSD can measure crystal orientations and all associated measurements such as texture, grain size, strain, boundary characterization, etc. It is a quantitative technique, so phase fractions can be determined. Phases can also be identified and that can be complemented with EDS data which can even be acquired in parallel. The combination of EDS and EBSD is quite common as both chemical and microstructural information can be provided and correlated at the same time. Microstructural characterization can help understand material properties. For battery materials, both EBSD and its combination with EDS are invaluable not only for quality control applications, but also R&D as we will see next. R&D type of applications require more thorough sample preparation, unlike QAQC routine procedures that we will see next. For EBSD, the sample surface has to be carefully polished as the technique is surface sensitive. EBSD utilizes backscattered electrons which satisfy the Bragg conditions for diffraction. The higher the accelerating voltage is, the sharper the electron backscatter diffraction patterns are, an example of which you can see on the left. Tilt enables maximum BSE yield, maximizing thus the signal the EBSD detector receives. On the right, you can see a schematic of the relative positions of the EDS and the EBSD detectors, the microscope pole piece and the tilted sample, as well as the electron backscatter diffraction pattern formed on the EBSD detector phosphor screen. So the problem with cathode materials is a lack of understanding of their performance variation. With chemical and structural analysis, newly formed phases can be identified and characterized in terms of their grain size, texture and grain boundaries. All that results in better understanding of the material degradation mechanisms so that new generation materials can be designed in the future, which will be sturdier and more reliable. The benefits of structural characterization is that the particle size in precursor powders can be controlled. The desired properties are that particles are large, their porosity is low, and that there are few grain boundaries inside the particles. In the electron image at the bottom, you can see a section of an NCM particle. Some features of its internal structure can be discerned. These features can be imaged and quantified with EBSD, as we will see in the following slide. The features that were barely visible in the electron image in the previous slide are clearly distinguished in the EBSD band contrast image on the top right. The particle clearly contains a much finer grain structure. There are even some grains with an average grain diameter finer than 600 nanometers. Another layer of information is crystal orientation. The colorful image below the band contrast map shows the crystal orientation of the detected grains. The orientation distribution suggests that the material is not strongly textured. A possible interpretation is that the grains formed and grew randomly. Different cathode formulations have their own microstructure. The cathode microstructure is affected by cycling, therefore it changes during the lifetime of the battery. The images on the left show an ion milled section of an NCM811 sample before and after cycling. The cracks that formed within the particles denote how drastic the changes are 
that take place in the cathodes with multiple charging and discharging cycles. The set of images on the right shows a different NCM powder sample with large particles containing fewer grain boundaries within them. The combination fewer grains with fewer grain boundaries within them is considered to form a material that is more stable. Battery materials tend to be sensitive and reactive. If the requirement is to study fresh sample surfaces, then liftouts can be performed in a scanning electron microscope using a nanomanipulator. The thin samples can then be analyzed with an EBSD technique known as transmission Kikuchi diffraction, or TKD for short. The advantage of that procedure is that even though it requires more rigorous sample preparation, it can provide much higher resolution. Allow me to add a last comment on R&D type applications. I would like to briefly talk about correlative microscopy. Compared to the previous slides, this is a change of subject, but correlative microscopy might contribute to R&D as well. Correlative microscopy aims at combining datasets. It works by overlaying different datasets originating from different techniques and instruments. The dataset correlation is aided by visualization. Quantitative analysis can be performed on the combined datasets. The example showcased here is of a cathode showing such a correlation of two different datasets. The datasets combined and visualized in the short video are from electron microscopy and atomic force microscopy. Atomic force microscopy is another surface analysis technique that uses a fine tip to map the sample surface. Unfortunately, we do not have any time to talk about it today. Now let's see what we do to ensure material consistency throughout manufacturing with scanning electron microscopy. I would like to start by asking the question, how can we ensure that the battery precursor powders are meeting the necessary gold standard? One of the ways to ensure the cleanliness of battery powders is particle analysis. There have been several incidents of battery recalls due to poor quality, most of them costly besides coming with negative publicity. Reported Car battery fire incidents have forced the automotive industry into performing rigorous quality control as the material impurity content can negatively affect the lithium-ion battery performance. Copper or iron particles are common contaminants. Mixing metal impurities into electrode materials, either cathodes or anodes, is quite dangerous. Such metal particles can speed up battery reactions, gradually leading to unpredictable consequences after many cycles. During production, sharp metal particles can pierce the diaphragm, in which case direct failure is caused. Monitoring both the raw and precursor material quality and the production environment is critical to the final product quality. Since contaminants can be introduced at any point during the manufacturing process of batteries, quality control must be an ongoing practice, especially because some contaminants can cause immediate battery failure. The concept of particle analysis is simple. Particle analysis aims at identifying harmful contaminants and can also be employed to identify the sources of contamination so that the standard operating procedures can be modified accordingly to avoid introducing contamination in the future. So how is particle analysis performed? To answer that question, we will see an example. We know that lithium-ion batteries consist of different parts, the cathode, the positive electrode, the anode, the negative electrode, the electrolyte and metal connections to the cathode and anode. In this example, we focus on the cathode material, however same issue applies to other parts of the manufacturing. Similar to our sample, the cathode is typically made from a mixture of metal oxide powders such as nickel oxide, cobalt oxide and manganese oxide. It is important that there are no contaminants in these powders 
as particle contamination can cause failure of the final product. Commonly, large metallic particles can create short circuits as mentioned earlier. In this example, we are looking at the NCM powder to 1. Confirm its consistency in terms of chemistry and 2. Look for potential contamination by silver, copper or tin particles. On the left, you can see an example of automated acquisition. The particles are identified based on the backscattered electron image. Then a spectrum is collected per particle so that only relevant data is collected. And the process is efficient and fast. The results are put in a classification, the image in the middle, where the total number of particles analyzed appears at the top right, whereas under it, there is a breakdown of the number of particles per class. On the right, you can see an example of using the X-ray data collected per particle. In this case, ternary plots can be made in software so that the NCM battery powder chemistry is regularly monitored and appropriately constrained. Here, I have used the NCM class to produce the ternary plot. Similarly, other classes can be used depending on the problem. The NCM powder appears to be consistent in terms of chemistry and no outliers have been observed in this case. Okay, so thanks very much, James and Alexandra. Really uh, nice videos there. We're gonna go to the first poll during the webinar. So I'll just ask Chris to launch that up. So our first poll is how useful do you think uh, scanning electron microscopy EDS would be in quality control? You can select one answer whether that's uh, very useful, sort of useful, or not very useful. Uh, so as you uh, get on and, and do that vote, I would just remind you that you can ask questions at any point during the webinar. We have several good questions coming in, and I can see that um, um, uh, James and Alexandra have been answering a few already, but do keep those coming in during the course of the webinar, um, and we will, uh, be able to answer them either online or in the uh, at the end there. So I think we've still got a few more votes coming in. So just to remind you, they uh, there are um, a whole series of webinars on the Chemistry World webinars website. If you go to www.chemistryworld.com slash webinars, and then you'll find details of all the webinars coming up um, in the next few weeks. And I would definitely recommend you tune in to a few of those. Okay, I think we're starting to sort of slow down a little bit. We've got a good proportion of people voted. So I'll ask Chris to uh, slow, uh, to close the vote and we'll have a look at the results. Uh, so unsurprisingly, quite a lot of you think that uh, these techniques would be very useful for quality control. I think that's, uh, quite reassuring to see. Okay, uh, so now it's time to go back to James for another quick video presentation before we have the live Q&A at the end of the session. So now you've seen how we can use Benchtop NMR for the research and development of battery materials and we've shown you how scanning electron microscopy techniques can be used for both the research and development and quality control of battery materials. Now it's time for me to show you how we can use benchtop NMR to observe and control electrolyte quality. Now I've previously shown you this set of spectra showing just how many different nuclei in a commercial electrolyte we could probe with a single X-pulse benchtop NMR instrument. We can probe and quantify the solvent with proton and carbon. The an ion of our lithium salt using fluorine, phosphorus, or boron, and that cation lithium with our seven lithium. And I'm going to focus initially on solvent composition. So taking a very simple proton NMR spectrum acquired in probably less than two minutes, we can see in this particular example every single constituent part of that solvent. We can see that there are 
three uh, typical battery solvents present, as well as a typical additive material. We can see the two singlets associated with ethylene carbonate and dimethyl carbonate. And we can see the two multiplets. The triplet is about 2 ppm, and the quartet, at just less than 5 ppm, of diethyl carbonate. And then we have that stabilising agent of vinylene carbonate at about 8.2 ppm. And, as we've said before, we can clearly identify all those different species, and because NMR is inherently quantitative, we can easily quantify the amount of those components from this spectrum by taking the integrals of those peaks using that with the molecular weight of uh, the molecules, we can easily understand the weight percentage of those components in our mixture. So what that gives us is that we have essentially a third, third, third mixture of dimethyl carbonate, ethylene carbonate, diethyl carbonate, with a small amount of vinegar carbonate at about 2.5% by weight, which is exactly what we were expecting. What we can also do as part of this is we can track very small amounts of important material such as the vinegar carbonate stabilizing agent. Vinegar carbonate is used to form a good SEI layer and the optimum concentration for that is in the region of about 2.8%. And you can see here that we can very easily quantify that using NMR spectra uh, down to less than 1%. So we can cover that range that's crucial for ensuring the consistency of materials. Now here's a nice little case study to show just how powerful NMR is detected can be. We were supplied with two samples meant to be the same chemistry hexafluorophosphate in ethylene carbonate and ethyl methyl carbonate, but we observed a performance and a difference in their performance when put inside an actual battery cell. Both were colorless liquids, so what was the difference? Well, obviously, we initially went to that 1D proton and mass spectrum, as we do everywhere. And actually, when you compare them, we see almost no difference. Just given this information about the solvent, there's no difference and therefore no idea as to why the performance difference is observed. However, if we quickly swap to fluory NMR, where we're now probing the anion of our lithium salt, we immediately see a difference. So on the bottom, in one of them, we see the doublet associated with lithium hexafluorophosphate. In the top spectrum, we see not just that doublet, but a second doublet, a clear indication that there is something else there that's not meant to be there, and most likely a breakdown product from the salt itself. So, with two quick measurements, the entire set of those being less than five minutes, we can see that there's no effect on the solvent, and actually we're seeing a performance difference as a result of differences or degradation of the hexafluorophosphate anion in our, in our electrolyte. The doublet, because of the chemical shift, is associated with phosphodifluoric acid, which we know to be a byproduct of a hydrolysis reaction. And there are a lot of ways that these electrolytes can break down, take lots of different um, decomposition routes, from polymerization of the solvent, which we would have seen from that proton NMR, through to that degradation of the anion through hydrolysis. And if we probe that in more detail, we can start to understand exactly how these electrolytes decompose. That allows us to understand how to stabilize them for the future and how to increase performance for the longer life cycles of batteries. So we repeated that previous experiment, but instead we forced that hydrolysis reaction so we can actually understand how these materials degrade. 
And what we did was take a spectrum every 30 minutes after putting a drop of water in our electrolyte solution. And the effect is instantaneous. We immediately see a decrease in our hexafluorophosphate red signal and an increase in the yellow and green signals associated with the phosphofluoric acids that appear as part of that reaction described on the right. We also see a significant increase in lithium fluoride. Again, step two of that reaction is the formation of lithium fluoride and PF5. We also start to see the production of hydrofluoric acid. So we can start to understand not just the fact that our materials have decomposed, but exactly how they're doing it. And that is crucial for understanding and increasing the lifespan of our lithium ion batteries. So, thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed what we've shown you today. And it's now time to open up the floor for questions. Thank you for listening. Okay, so thanks very much to James for that. We've just got one quick poll to do before we go to the Q&A. So I'll just ask uh, Chris to launch that up. So the, the second poll is, where do you think that benchtop NMR would be most useful for battery materials? You can select one answer, it's so whether you think it's in quality control, in research and development, in failure analysis, or in raw materials. Okay, so just as we go through, I'll just give you a little bit of time to do that question. Reminder, we are still here, you know, we're about to go into the live Q&A session, so do get your questions in now so that we can see all the questions. Um, and yeah, to do that, just, yeah, I can see some questions coming in, so that's really good. Um, a reminder that you will all get a copy of the recording uh, in a couple of days by email and you will get a certificate of attendance in that same email if that's something that uh, you need okay i think we we could just leave it for a few more seconds although it looks like everyone who's voted has now finished so yeah i'll ask chris to uh, just close the poll there and we'll have a quick look at the results. Okay, so there's a bit of a split there. Obviously the two um, most popular categories are quality control and R&D, um, but still a few votes in, in the other categories. James, can you give us an idea? I mean, my I have a sneaking suspicion that it might be quite useful in all of those areas. Uh, is that uh, something that you would agree with? Uh, yes, I. I... Uh, I would agree that it's it's very useful in all those areas, um, especially potentially even the failure analysis and raw materials um, that are are not so popular there. Um, ensuring that you've got good materials coming out of the front end usually uh, ensures that you uh, have good material coming out of the uh, the other end of the process. But uh, you know, ensuring quality uh, of the raw materials then definitely enables that that quality control as well. Uh, I was I'm actually quite surprised just to see how popular the sort of use of our uh, NMR for the R&D side of things um, is. That's, that's something that is very interesting to me in terms of seeing how potentially interested this audience is in those diffusion measurements that we spoke about um, earlier in the presentation. Great. OK, well, um, so now I'm going to ask James and Alexandra to turn on their cameras and join us for the live questions uh, part of the webinar. The first question that I'm going to ask is to um, James. It's a question from Calvin. Uh, can you give us an idea of some of the recommended solvents and internal standards that you've used for testing different battery materials and electrolytes? Uh, yes, yeah, uh, no problem at all. This is something that I was actually in the process of typing that uh, answer back, but it seems like it's going to be easier for me to talk it through. Um, actually, most of the electrolytes we analyze neat. Uh, we don't use any sort of typical NMR solvents. That means that it's actually much 
we get a much better understanding of the diffusion coefficient because it's going to be as it would be in the in the final cell. Uh, sometimes we do use um, a a tutorated solvent uh, to dilute the uh, the solution that gives you usually actually some enhancement in the resolution uh, because uh, at those as you sort of move away from those very high concentrations of those um, organic solvents in the electrolyte for sort of the internal standards um, that will sort of come down to exactly what uh, your uh, what you're interested in. For example, for uh, fluorine NMR, we tend to see a lot of people using something like um, hexafluorobenzene, um, gives you a nice singlet or well away from anything else that uh, would be in the spectrum. Um, the beauty of our instruments, actually, to, to some extent for when you're doing this, is that you can actually use an external standard. So that means that you we can generate a calibration curve, say on your lithium quantity, we can use several different um, uh, concentrations of lithium, uh, generate our calibration curve, curve, and that means that you can then measure directly in your neat uh, solution. So you're not actually affecting uh, your electrolyte by your measurement, and you're, you're probing what should be there in, in uh, and not necessarily your sample preparation. Great, okay. Uh, and we've got a couple of questions here for Alexandra. So the first one is from Alexander. Uh, how many particles can you scan at a time using some of these techniques? So you, can you scan multiple particles, lots of, uh, or arrays of particles? Uh, yes, well, the technique is very fast. Um, we typically say 120,000 particles per hour for collecting both morphological and the uh, chemical data. However, if you just want uh, to uh, measure like morphological data, you can go even faster. It depends on how you set up uh, the acquisition, really, and how dense your sample is. It's something that you can optimize depending on uh, your specific needs. Okay, that's a, that's a really good answer. And uh, another question for Alexandra. Um, from Chetna, can you use EBSD to determine the phases of the electrode? I'm guessing when, if, there's a, if you've got particles with mixtures of different phases, perhaps. Yes, uh, so you can combine EBS uh, with EBSD. So uh, with EBS, you can determine the chemistry of the phase. And if you have uh, multiple phases of uh, the same chemistry, you can use EBSD to distinguish uh, the phases based on their crystallography. So it's a very powerful combination. Great. Okay. Um, I've got another question which I think is probably most likely to go to Alexandra. It's from Lee and it's, um, can, oh no, actually, no, it's about the NMR. So it's probably more for James. It's talking about can you do the NMR testing in situ inside a battery cell while it's charging or discharging? Uh, so that that that's an interesting one, and actually um, a focus of a few different research efforts at the moment. Um, you can't necessarily fit the full cell uh, in these NMR spectrometers. Um, they usually take only something a, a little smaller than that, and we tend to use uh, try and be in liquid state. However, Claire Gray's group at, at Cambridge have started doing um, experiments with sort of in situ charging and discharging. And that's something that we're really interested to look at is how you could then move that onto the bench top. So you, know, you can do it right by your formulation as you're developing these materials, giving you that sort of much more, uh, more instantaneous feedback. But it's a, it's a really good question as to, you know, understanding how these things change in the real situation, which is going to be crucial to sort of uh, understanding and optimizing performance for the future. Yes, I think we reported that uh, paper in Chemistry World from, from Claire Gray's group. I think something, something about standing the battery on its edge to make it um, <laughs> To, to, fit, to fit or to, to make the analysis work. But um, yeah, you can definitely find more about that on Chemistry World if you so desire. So uh, another question for James uh, from Martin, which I think you've um, you've given an answer to, but I think it's worth asking again 
Um, can you give us a bit more detail about how you uh, how you calculate the um, transference numbers um, based on NMR diffusion coefficients and um, and what the significance of that is? Yes. So um, I say I, I have answered this, and because I wanted to ensure that there were some references there for people to look up afterwards. Um, but this is really sort of key to what we can do with diffusion. So essentially what we're looking at there is the balance of uh, the cation and the anion diffusion. There are a number of equations that were in the presentation um, that essentially are just comparing that diffusion coefficient. It, um, so, and depending on which way uh, round you have your diffusion coefficients, that essentially gives you your transference of either your anion or your cation. Um, and there are a number um, of references, which I, I did put in the answer there, which I think went out to everybody, where they show that that actually correlates very well with sort of uh, electrophoric type measurements, um, where you're actually measuring that, that conductivity um, directly. Um, uh, and there's very good agreement between the NMR and uh, those uh, complementary measurements as well. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so another question for Alexandra. Um, can you give us a bit more information about the the kind of trade-off uh, between using a, a low accelerating voltage so that you're trying to cause less damage to the system uh, to the to the sample, but presumably that gives you a, a less strong signal so there's a balance to be had there can you can you give us a bit more information about how you balance those things up so well all these parameters depend on the kind of uh, work that you're trying to do and what you're trying to achieve uh, there are products that are designed for surface sensitive analysis that uh, are not affected by the lower signal. The major advantage on that is that uh, the surface sensitivity is maximized when we use a low accelerating voltage. So we can uh, map very fine details very accurately. Okay, so is that related to that first slide that you had with the teardrop? Presumably that's, uh, yes. that, that is much yeah. smaller of the lower, so you yes. get a finer detail. Yeah. Yes, and it is concentrated uh, towards the surface of the sample, so you can actually uh, be more sure where your signal is coming from. Right, that's excellent. why that sensitivity is uh, so important. Okay, um, and we've got one more question for James. I think, do you need to use deuterated solvents to, uh, to quantify the electrolyte solvent composition? I think you mentioned actually that you do these neat. So is that that maybe that question is not? Uh, yes. So so I think I think that's probably um, to some extent been answered. But it's worth reiterating that you know we do do these measurements neat. Um, that means that you don't have to change your formulation from how it would go into your battery to how it would um, go into your NMR system. So I think that's always a very powerful. Uh, uh, powerful measurement. Great. Okay, so I think we've just about come to the end of our time slot here. So uh, it just remains for me to thank James and Alexandra once more for uh, some fantastic presentations. There's some really good answers to some of those questions. Um, I hope that everyone's uh, really got the answers that they need uh, for from the webinar. Um, thanks again to Oxford Instruments for sponsoring. Um, there have been a few URLs and things sent out and the answers to the questions, so do grab those before the end of the webinar if you'd like to take copies, although you can always come back to the recording and check them again. Um, you will, of course, get uh, an email in a couple of days with a link to the recording and your certificate of attendance, so thanks again for attending. It's really important you as the audience uh, uh, the main kind of reason why we're doing these things so uh, that's uh, it's great to have you here uh, if you did like the webinar do remember to check out chemistryworld.com slash webinars to see other topics coming up uh, and I hope to see you in another webinar soon my name is Philip Broadith I'm the business editor of chemistry world and we shall see you again in another webinar <laughs>